This is Greg Troutwine with Offshore Engineer TV, and we're pleased to be joined again by Matthew Tremblay, the Senior Vice President, Global Offshore Markets for the American Bureau of Shipping, ABS. Matt, again, a pleasure to see you. Good to see you, Greg. Okay. So Matt, uh, to start us off, 2020 has obviously delivered a double whammy to the offshore energy market in the form of both the COVID-19 pandemic and a historically battered energy price. Can you give us an outlook on the markets from the perspective of class? Sure. Um, you know, it's amazing when you look at what the market's been subjected to, uh, how well it's been able to respond to an unprecedented situation. Uh, you know, just when we thought we'd begun to see the light at the end of the tunnel of the downturn, the global economy and especially transportation and energy is hit with the effects of COVID-19. So we can clearly see some sectors such as offshore drilling continue to struggle through reductions and exploration spending from their traditional customers. Uh, but we can also see the offshore production market beginning to rebound with measurable year-on-year -year growth in, in new projects expected in 2021. You know, over the long term, you know, we do see a mostly flat business environment over the next few years with uh, offshore wind growth being a unique exception and uh, offshore production FID showing a moderate but steady growth. But beyond the business outlook, what we really see in the global response to the pandemic, it's been a catalyst for some real positive change as well. The easiest example is how much more quickly we've all adopted remote work technology to perform our day-to-day -day business. And, uh, but that means both using Zoom and MS Teams to collaborate, but it also stretches into some real interesting stuff and accelerated use of remote survey tools and new digital solutions to support designs and operations. As you just pointed out, and as you know better than I, all talk is turning to cutting cost and increasing tangible efficiencies. In this regard, the term digital twin often comes up. Just to start us off, can you tell us exactly what is a digital twin? Well, the, the concept of the digital twin was first developed by NASA in the 1960s as part of the Apollo space missions. But the, the term digital twin was really recognized as, as a commercial technology in the early 2000s. Uh, in the offshore context, you know, a digital twin technology is being increasingly adopted by operators to help them use their data better and, and, and manage their offshore assets, in particular for, for a better understanding of the asset integrity. But as awareness of digital twin has grown, so is the variety of definitions used to describe it. And it's kind of threatening to dilute the concept a little bit with unrealistic expectations. You know, so what we've done is we've kind of defined the, the, the things in common with various definitions uh, that, and it, it can really be captured by three primary components that make up a digital twin. First, there has to be a physical reality. There has to be a physical thing that you're, you're trying to, uh, to simulate. Next, there needs to be a virtual representation of that, of that physical asset. And last, there needs to be interconnections and exchanges of information between the physical thing and the virtual thing. Uh, the key requirement for a digital twin that makes it unique from other digital models is that a digital twin represents a single instance of the system that's updated to reflect changes to that system over time. Okay. So in the context, and I'm thinking of uh, the companies, the organizations that are responsible for designing, building, installing, and life cycle maintenance of a complex offshore structure, what exactly does a digital twin offer? What kinds of things does it solve? Sure. Well, you know, ultimately, a digital twin is a tool. And it, it's the starting point it, it is to define what problem that your digital twin is trying to help you manage and solve. Um, the, the targeted outcomes of that digital twin, they need to be measurable and quantifiable. When you're building the design of that digital twin, it has to be built around a, a quantifiable outcome that allows you to define the value proposition for that investment. You know, one example uh, of an outcome that's being supported by digital twins today that's, that's not always thought of is, is its ability to reduce the risks associated with emergency response situations offshore. You know, most emergency events require detailed engineering analysis, such as a, like a finite element analysis to answer questions before resuming operations. Any delay offshore can be extremely costly especially in the time frame required to create new models of an asset in the current condition from drawings and reports you may have on file. So the ABS has developed the ABS Offshore Enhanced Rapid Response Damage Assessment, 
And that expands the scope of our traditional rapid response program by maintaining an asset specific condition model and operation history in a digital twin so that the information can act as kind of like insurance where in the unfortunate case that you do have an emergency incident, a model of the affected areas can be extracted really quickly from the maintained digital twin for rapid analysis. Okay. I know you and I know ABS, you sit at the heart of digitalization in both on my maritime side and my offshore side. And when, when talk turns to digitalization, um, it often turns to how far and how fast. So as an owner operator that's considering integrating a digital twin into the, their company, into their workflow, into their systems, um, is this an all-in technology or can it be implemented incrementally? That's a really good, good question and a good point. Um, you know, you may ultimately at the end of the day in a perfect future scenario, want to know about every aspect of an entire asset. But do you currently today have the time or the money or the resources to create all the necessary models and data infrastructure to capture all of that detail? You know, an alternative is to focus on the known critical areas where the value of a digital twin approach can be demonstrated and then build in, around that in phases from there. You know, the key to the incremental approach to developing a digital twin is to utilize and work with existing technologies, processes, and data. Uh, you don't need to invent something brand new. There's technologies today that can be integrated to support that. You know, you may have this grand vision of, of what your end state digital twin could ultimately look and function like, but uh, by using a more incremental approach, you can start with a smaller version and grow it from there. You know, this is because you don't need to have a digital twin with the largest scope and greatest fidelity right from the outset for it to be effective in doing what you need it to do. Okay. Um, it's interesting because recently on my maritime side, I had an interesting interview with uh, ABS's uh, Kash Mahmood, uh, Senior Vice President for Digital Solutions. And that was on uh, the introduction of my digital fleet. Um, I know that was on the maritime side, but is there a role for my digital fleet on this incremental journey, uh, sure. for the, for, on this incremental journey? Yeah, well, you know, the my digital fleet suite of applications isn't just for ships. You know, many of the integrated applications are just as applicable to the offshore fleet as they are to the marine fleet. Uh, the, the my digital fleet and its, its suite of digital solutions provide a, a 360 view of an asset's operational health and risk profile. And which is the intent is to really empower offshore operators to anticipate emerging issues, optimize maintenance strategies, and, and as we all want to do, reduce our operational costs. You know, so there's a very direct role uh, for many of the My Digital Fleet applications that can play a part of a digital twin. You know, one example is the condition manager application, especially when you integrate it with a 3D counterpart. You know, this software is immediately available to serve as the heart of a condition model for a digital twin. Yeah, and serving as a condition tracking system and integrating that with onboard maintenance systems, Condition Manager was designed to promote maintenance program optimization. You know, and another, another uh, application within the, the uh, My Digital Fleet is the, the Structural Dashboard tool. Uh, structural Dashboard can provide fatigue loading and build a real-time view of remaining calculated design life of a floating asset, giving an operator what amounts to a continuous life extension analysis. Can you concisely summarize, what do you see as the advantages for an incremental approach um, of the digital twin for the offshore sector? Well, I mean, the beauty of using an incremental implementation model is that you can start by targeting some very specific outcomes and implementing only what's necessary, leveraging existing data sources and models and as much as you can uh, without having to create new tools. You know, in many cases, the incremental approach starts by continuing to rely on human in the loop approaches for data collection, and then later incorporating real time sensor data as it's needed or becomes available. So in the incremental approach, you know, each aspect of the digital twin only needs to have the level of fidelity required to achieve the targeted outcomes. This avoids developing an overly complex and potentially, you know, technically infeasible digital twin which is a, a possible outcome with today's trend toward high fidelity models. Um, so you need to find that optimum balance between the level of detail required to address a problem, but as well with the, the cost of collecting and analyzing that data. 
you know, not all insights you could get from a digital twin really require real-time streaming data, for example. You know, an incremental approach might use periodic and lower fidelity data that can provide a reasonable approximation of potential risks. And that really kind of gives you the power to start seeing the early benefits and improve decision-making. Okay. Well, Matt, great insights as always. We appreciate your time. Greg, it's great to see you. Take care.